Now that we have completed a lecture series on the neuromuscular control of human movement, let's go ahead and move on to a new lecture series that is centered on chronic changes to long-term exercise. In other words, physiological adaptations to long-term exercise, commonly referred to as training. Now keep in mind there are some nuances in the terms exercise and training in this scientific field, and we will define and distinguish those terms in a couple of slides. So if we go back to our very first lecture series on neuromuscular physiology in the context of neuromuscular contractions, we talked about the hows of muscular contractions and therefore uh, movement. In other words, we discussed the underlying mechanisms of voluntary muscle contractions, which as we should know by now involve sequential events from the nervous system all the way down to the skeletal muscle. Now that lecture topic was in general on acute responses. We talked about the differences between acute and chronic. So just to reiterate, this means the immediate physiological response to a particular muscular force demand. So for example, how the neuromuscular system responds when you need to squat 150 pounds on the barbell, for example. So what this current lecture series is about is how these acute responses change over time with training again long-term repeated bouts of exercise so for example if you squat 100 pounds then 150 pounds then 200 pounds in sequential sets and then in the next set you try 250 pounds and you cannot do more than one rep 250 pounds is your max for the squat in other words for the squat 250 pounds is your maximal strength or force producing capacity for that particular exercise. Now this current lecture series is discussing the whys and hows of increasing the capacity so that one day you will be able to squat 280 pounds, for example. So increasing your one rep max for the back squat. This is what this lecture series is talking about. So we generally know without really thinking too hard about it, that in order for us to achieve this increase in force producing capacity of our neuromuscular system during the squat, this is achieved through long-term resistance exercise programs, also known as resistance training. Again, this term training implying long-term repeated bouts of resistance exercise. So with that being said, this lecture series will focus on the fundamental science underlying neuromuscular strength development. And as you can see, I'm not simply saying muscular strength development. I am intentionally using the term neuromuscular strength development. As both the nervous system and skeletal muscle is involved in force production, as we discussed in our very first lecture series, likewise, an increase in force production capacity or strength development is a result of adaptations in both the nervous system and skeletal muscle to repeated bouts of high force demands, i.e. resistance training. Lots of times, many people attribute strength development to just simply adaptations in the muscle itself. But we have to understand strength development is largely attributable to changes in the nervous system, even in the absence of any changes in the skeletal muscle itself. So for this lecture series, we will compartmentalize it by discussing the adaptations in the nervous system that contribute to strength development, and then talk about adaptations happening in skeletal muscle. And then we'll bring it all together as we wrap up this lecture series. All right, so as a brief overview of this lecture series, we will first define resistance training and what its distinction is from resistance exercise. So a little bit of terminology there and also what is training adaptations, fundamentally speaking. Then a comprehensive discussion on neuromuscular strength development will be the meat of this lecture series. And as I said before, we will section this off by first talking about the neural adaptations and then the skeletal muscle adaptations or simply muscular adaptations both of these contributing again to strength development. Now, as you can see some descriptors next to these two terms, neural adaptations is a central adaptation, central referring to central command of force production, which is the nervous system. And anything outside of the nervous system in this particular case will be referred to as the periphery. So in the context of neuromuscular adaptations to resistance training, 
the skeletal muscle adaptation is the peripheral adaptation. Another example of the central and peripheral adaptation dynamic is the adaptation to endurance training in the cardiovascular system, which is central, accompanied by adaptation in muscle metabolism or aerobic metabolism in muscle, which is peripheral. Uh, this will be our last lecture series of the semester, so hold on tight for that. Uh, we will conclude this lecture series on neuromuscular adaptations to resistance training with evidence-based principles of resistance training, such as the principle of progressive overload, which relates to the topic of the general adaptation syndrome and training program periodization. So let's go ahead and get to it. So how is the term resistance exercise defined in the field of exercise science? This term exercise relates to our first lecture series in the sense that it implies acute or immediate responses. So resistance exercise is any activity that requires an acute or immediate increase in motor unit activity for the purpose of generating a muscular force sufficient to overcome an external load or resistance that is imposed on the active muscles or muscle groups. So in other words, resistance exercise is a situation in which our neuromuscular system is required to generate higher levels of force due to a higher level of force demand, which is typically afforded through some kind of resistance like weights or friction perhaps. So when you go to the gym and do some back squats and then some lunges and say hip thrusters, this bout of exercise is what is being referred to when we use the term resistance exercise. Or resistance exercise can refer to a single execution or performance of a particular exercise like the squats. Also keep in mind resistance exercise involves force demands and therefore force production that your neuromuscular system is not accustomed to or already adapted to. So for most of us active individuals, walking, for example, is not really a form of resistance exercise because it involves force demands and thus force production that we are already used to or adapted to. Now, this is a critical concept for you to understand as we discuss resistance training. Uh, which involves adapting to something that you are not accustomed to. Okay, so now then how is resistance training defined in the science? As I mentioned earlier, the term training implies long-term application of exercise to elicit some type of adaptation or long-term change within our body. So resistance or strength training is a long-term program comprised of repeated, that's the key word there, repeated resistance exercise bouts with the intent of improving or maintaining neuromuscular strength, or in other words, force production capacity. So as you can tell here, the overarching adaptation, so the overall adaptation to resistance training would then be an improvement in neuromuscular strength or strength development. Now this is the change that we experience when we continually engage in resistance exercise over a period of time. And as I indicated before, this overarching adaptation of strength development is a result of individual adaptations that occur in the nervous system and skeletal muscle, not just skeletal muscle itself. Now, some may be thinking, isn't muscle growth also the intention of resistance training? Well, yes, from a practical standpoint, that can be the case, but we will discuss how muscle growth is an underlying contributor to strength development and that strength development and muscle growth are not mutually independent adaptations. More on this later. So the next question is, why do we adapt to resistance training and why is it that the outcome of these adaptations is improved strength? Why is it that certain weights feel quote unquote lighter or you are able to move certain weights with more efficiency over time? What is this phenomenon based on? So to answer this, let's discuss the fundamental reason as to why we experience changes in our body in response to training, whatever training mode it may be, whether it's endurance training or resistance training, the concept remains the same. 
Now, these changes collectively is simply a long-term response to a continuous stressor imposed on our body or some parts of our body like the nervous system and or muscle. Now, this is why we call these changes adaptations because they are a result of adapting to a stressor. Now, training adaptation is simply a form of stress relief. Uh, when we train, the exercise that we perform is technically a stressor uh, that we are intentionally imposing on our body because we know generally at least that in response to the stress over time, the body will change. And that initial stressor will no longer be stressful anymore as we adapt. This is what I mean by stress relief, a biological stress relief system, if you will. We never really view training in this manner. We think of it more from a general societal perspective of exercise or training is good because we just get physically stronger as a result of it. But from a biological perspective, exercise can be viewed as a negative thing because it is indeed a stressor. And so when this stressor is consistently imposed over time, the body figures out a way to overcome it through adaptations. So it's really a way for the body to protect itself because a stressor can cause damage to the body or some parts of the body like muscle. And this characteristic of adaptability within biological organisms like humans is referred to as plasticity as highlighted in bold red font right here. Now plasticity is one of the unique aspects of biological organisms and our ability as humans for the multiple cells and tissues that make up our body to be able to individually adapt to a unique stressor is what makes us so biologically sophisticated comparatively. Now again, plasticity or adaptability is fundamentally for the purpose of protection because a stressor can indeed cause damage. And so because it's for the purpose of protection, it is fundamentally also for the purpose of survival of the biological organism, in this case, us, the human our bodies adapt to a continuous stressor so that we may be protected from the damage that can be caused by that stressor for the ultimate sake of survival. Again, we never really think of training and the adaptations or the changes in our body as a result of training in this particular manner. But all training is, is a repeated stressor to our body or some parts of our body, like our neuromuscular system. And training adaptation is simply how our body changes to contend with the stressor so that the stressor is no longer stressful. So let's talk about the specific stressor that is associated with resistance training that would ultimately lead to adaptations, i.e. strength development. First, we need to understand the SED principle, which stands for specific adaptation to imposed demand, meaning the physiological adaptation is specific to a particular stressor that is repeatedly imposed on the body or parts of the body like the neuromuscular system. So the stressor and the adaptation go hand in hand. They are specific to one another. So in the case of resistance training, we generally know that the overarching physiological adaptation is increased neuromuscular strength or more technically force producing capacity. So the question is what type of stressor is this an adaptation to? What type of stressor is strength development an adaptation to? By answering this question, we will better understand why we get stronger and why certain loads, for example, are easier to move as a result of resistance training. So first, let's turn to this simple figure on the bottom left right here. Now, during resistance exercise, we generally lift heavy objects like a dumbbell. This is a resistance to muscular forces the load applies an opposing force to muscular forces. So in this example right here, the downward force of the dumbbell is being counteracted by the force produced by the contracting biceps so that you can produce elbow flexion, right? The bicep has to produce elevated tension and therefore force to counteract this dumbbell. Now, as a result of this exercise, we see here that the muscle experiences elevated tension. How? Well, we know that when we contract against this load, the muscle tries to shorten as represented by these blue arrows pointing together, towards one another rather. And this is to move the lower arm upward against the force of the dumbbell. 
So meanwhile, the dumbbell is exerting an opposing force downward, especially at the ends of the muscle, especially right here at the end of the muscle and the tendon where it attaches to the bone. Now this force essentially tries to lengthen or pull the muscle apart. This is represented by the orange arrows. So as you can see, the muscle is undergoing some heavy tension here. We got the orange arrows pointing outwards and the blue arrows pointing inwards. So this represents opposing forces causing tension to the muscle. So imagine pulling apart the ends of an elastic band and then someone pulls the band inward in the middle of the band. You can imagine the amount of tension within this band here. You would say that the elastic band is under some kind of stress and that this stress can cause the band to perhaps break or tear or in other words, become damaged. Now relate this back to the muscle in this particular scenario. The elevated tension here to counteract the dumbbell is a stressor to the muscle. And this stressor is commonly referred to as mechanical stress. So elevated and more so unaccustomed muscle tension is synonymous with mechanical stress. So you could say muscle tension is mechanical stress or the mechanical stress during resistance exercises, specifically the elevated and unaccustomed muscle tension. This is what the muscle is exposed to every time you go to the gym to lift weights. So you are undergoing mechanical stress during a resistance exercise bout. And then you're repeating that over and over and over again through a training program. So if I ask the question, which of the following best describes the stress associated with resistance training, that would be mechanical stress as well as muscle tension. These mean the same thing in this particular case. So as we said before, a stressor can cause damage to the body or some parts of the body like muscle. Again, the whole point of adaptation is protection from damage caused by some type of stressor imposed on the body or some parts of the body. So what is the acute or immediate effect of mechanical stress during resistance exercise? As shown in the figure to the right, it is tension induced muscle damage. Now the most common cause of muscle damage or injury like a tear is elevated tension or in other words, elevated mechanical stress. So if the mechanical stress is way too high at any given moment, like say when you are playing sports, the muscle can undergo severe damage and this is called a tear or a strain. This is not what is typically happening during resistance training. The mechanical stress slash tension experienced typically during resistance exercise can cause very small levels of damage that is really mostly at the cellular level. This is why we call this myofiber damage or muscle fiber damage. So this is damage to the cells of the muscle, the muscle fibers. Now keep in mind, this is not to say that mechanical stress will always cause myofiber damage. It is rather that mechanical stress during resistance exercise can cause myofiber damage. This is important for you to know because many people think you must damage your muscles, you must destroy your muscles with soreness being an indicator of that in order to see muscular gains. This leads to people overworking themselves at the gym and constantly trying to achieve soreness. Yes, soreness is an indirect indication your muscles or muscle fibers have been damaged and so with everything being said, you need to understand that soreness is not at all an indicator of a quote unquote effective workout because you don't necessarily need damage in order to see some adaptations. You just need that stress, the mechanical stress that can cause damage. So the neuromuscular system adapts to this mechanical stress over time because the stress can cause damage not necessarily because it does cause damage. Make sure you understand this is a point of emphasis. So with that said, it is important for you to know that muscle damage is not the stimulus for neuromuscular adaptation. 
but it is rather the basis for neuromuscular adaptation. This is a key point. Remember, the principal reason for adaptation is to protect the cells and tissue from damage. So damage is not necessarily stimulating the adaptation, but rather the adaptations occur to minimize the risk for damage. Now the fundamental stimulus for adaptation is the mechanical stress. So to reiterate, you do not need to have damage to achieve adaptation. So in the context of resistance training, strength development, or rather neuromuscular strength development, is therefore an adaptation to reduce mechanical stress, or meaning becoming more resilient to some higher level of tension, or becoming more accustomed or adapted to some higher level of tension. So here's a practical example. Take a 40 pound dumbbell bicep curl. Initially, that 40 pound dumbbell curl produced X amount of tension and the muscle experienced X amount of mechanical stress and underwent X amount of damage. Over some period of training, your biceps become stronger. That same 40 pounds produces the same amount of tension but the level of mechanical stress and therefore damage is less. Why? Because your neuromuscular system has adapted or has become more resilient or accustomed to the X amount of tension produced by the 40 pound dumbbell. And all this is for the ultimate purpose of protecting against tension induced muscle damage or myofiber damage. So let's focus down here where this figure is and these descriptions. So with adaptation, we know that the stimulus for adaptation, which again is mechanical stress, will diminish over repeated bouts of the same resistance exercise stressor as you adapt to it. So let's take that 40 pound dumbbell curl example again. Over time, as your biceps get stronger and more accustomed slash adapted to the tension elicited by the 40 pound dumbbell curl, the mechanical stress of that 40 pound dumbbell curl diminishes over time because of adaptation. So if mechanical stress is the stimulus for adaptation, which again is strength development, and mechanical stress decreases with that 40 pound dumbbell curl as you adapt to it, how would the rate of adaptation be affected over time? Would you consistently see the same rate of strength development by training the same way over and over again? No, right? Because as you adapt, the mechanical stress diminishes for a given stressor, in this case, the 40 pound dumbbell curl. So with this example, what would you do to experience further adaptation or strength development? You would change something about your workout to reintroduce the same level of mechanical stress that stimulated the initial adaptations. So perhaps by increasing the load from 40 pounds to 50 pounds in your training, you would be able to reintroduce the same amount of mechanical stress as you did when you started off with 40 pounds because your biceps are not yet accustomed to the tension produced by the 50 pound curl since you've never done it. This is the basis for the principle of progressive overload. Um, we will discuss more on this topic towards the end of this lecture series as we get more to practical application. Okay, now that we've covered the fundamental aspects of neuromuscular adaptations to resistance training, the next question is how are these adaptations observed in real life practical scenarios? One common observation is simply an increase in the maximum amount of weight you can lift for a particular exercise for a given amount of reps. If you look here on the left, we see some general pre-training numbers. Let's say this is for the deadlift. At pre-training, the maximum load that you could deadlift for five reps was 435 pounds. The max load that you could lift for only one rep, also known as your one rep max, was 500 pounds. Now after some period of resistance training, let's just say one month, these numbers increase as one would expect. The max load that could be lifted no more than five times is now 520 pounds, 
and the one rep max improved to 600 pounds. Again, this observation is explained by an overarching adaptation of improved neuromuscular strength or force producing capacity. This can also be referred to as physiological strength as well. Now, as alluded to earlier, the reason why we describe this adaptation as neuromuscular is because adaptations occur in both the nervous system and the skeletal muscle itself. So there are neural and muscular adaptations that comprise the neuromuscular adaptation. So there are multiple adaptive processes occurring throughout resistance training. Now to break this down a little bit further, the way the motor nerve system activates muscle, so these are topics from the very first lecture series, that whole process of muscle contraction uh, related to the nervous system, that whole process and the morphology of the muscle, in other words, the physical characteristics of the muscle, are the two general components that determine strength. Now we will be discussing these two components and how they adapt to resistance training in much more detail. Uh, but first let's look at how else these adaptations are observed in real life situations. Now I want you to imagine you are doing a 100 pound squat. Then I want you to imagine how does that 100 pound squat begin to look and feel as you progress through your resistance training program and develop strength. If I asked you all how would it feel, many of you might say the 100 pounds feels lighter. Now, is it actually lighter? No, right? It is still 100 pounds. So it's not really getting lighter, it may just feel lighter. So if I asked you instead, how does the 100 pound squat look like now compared to pre-training, Many of you might say that you move the 100 pounds a lot faster. In other words, with more velocity. Anyone who does resistance training has experienced this. A given weight on a given exercise can be moved faster as you get stronger. This is the most commonly observed indicator that there is an increase in strength and that neuromuscular adaptations have occurred. Now, to explain the hows and whys, let's first examine the force-velocity relationship. Now, if you remember the force-velocity relationship from your very first lecture series, at least for the concentric muscle actions, you would know that there is an inverse relationship between force production and velocity, as shown here. The higher the force, the lower the velocity, and vice versa. Also, you must remember that this relationship is only relevant for max effort contractions. This is very important for you to remember, meaning you are moving whatever load as fast as you possibly can. So let's just first take a look at this red curve. Let's imagine you doing one body weight squat concentrically as fast as possible. Now, where on this red curve would that body weight squat be placed? It would be placed down here to the lower right of this red curve. High velocity, but low force production since the force demand is not that high. Then let's say you added 50 pounds and repeated the one concentric squat, again, as fast as possible. What happens to the velocity of this movement? It slows down, right? What happens to the force? It increases because there's approximately 50 more pounds you need to contract against. So you would place that 50 pound concentric squat a little bit higher and to the left on this red curve. Then increase the weight even more. What would happen? Same thing, less velocity, more force. Now you keep adding weight and you get to your one rep max. We know that the one rep max is generally moved really, really slowly but the force production is almost to the max. So your one RM load is placed really high up and to the left of the red curve. Then say you added more resistance and you concentrically squat as hard as possible. You can imagine you're not going to move no matter how hard you are contracting. There's no movement at all. So there is zero velocity and near maximum force production. This point is referred to as the maximum voluntary isometric contraction or force. And this is placed on the very top of this red curve. Again, zero velocity, near maximum force. 
So now let's go back to our example of the 100 pound squat and the question of why after a period of resistance training and developing strength does this 100 pound squat move significantly faster. We can explain this in part by examining how the force velocity curve is affected with training and strength development. As you see in this figure right here, the entire force velocity curve shifts up and to the right. Now, how does this affect performance? Let's take a look at the 100 pound squat example again, as you see right here. At pre-training, let's say we measured the concentric force and velocity of a max effort 100 pound concentric squat, and the data point was placed here on the force velocity curve. So this 100 pound squat had a certain velocity and a certain force produced. Now as a result of training and strength development, like I said, this curve moves up and to the right. So the 100 pound squat is now placed here on this new curve. As you can see, the 100 pound squat after training involves more force and more velocity. So what is the factor contributing to this increased force during the 100 pound squat? Well, remember, force equals mass times acceleration. Mass doesn't really change because the load and assumingly your body weight remains the same. So the only factor that contributes to the increased force production is acceleration, rather increased acceleration. In other words, the physiological adaptations resulting from training increases the force produced during the max effort 100 pound concentric squat by increasing the acceleration of the 100 pounds through the concentric squat. And as you can clearly observe with adaptations, you can move through the 100 pound concentric squat with greater velocity. You move it faster, okay? So in summary, both force and velocity increases for a given load on a given movement as you train and experience neuromuscular adaptations. Also, to conclude the last two slides, the practical indicators of neuromuscular adaptations and strength developments are one, increased maximum load for a given exercise for a certain amount of reps, like your one rep max, for example, or your five rep max, and two, increased velocity, and with that increased force, if you can measure it, for a given load for a particular exercise. Now, with that being said, what is the practical application of these conclusions? Does it mean that you have to do one rep max or five rep max test every single time you wanna see if you got stronger? Not necessarily. Sometimes it's just overrated to do that all the time. One thing that you can just subjectively observe and recognize is the fact that you are just simply moving a given load for a given exercise faster. If you are moving it faster, you don't even really have to utilize objective measurements. You can just assess this subjectively. If you're moving it, moving it faster, that is an indication that you are adapting to your resistance training program and you are indeed getting stronger.